All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our Ceph Tech Talk for May 28th. Uh, we have these live streams every fourth Thursday of the month, 1700 UTC. Uh, today, we will be hearing from Ceph engineers Josh Durgan uh, from Red Hat and some general improvements and features on the Ceph Octopus release. And we'll also be hearing from uh, Lynn Kramer from SUSE on new enhancements and features in the latest version. So go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Mike. So yeah, first I'll talk a bit about what's new in Octopus. So Octopus is the latest Ceph release, uh, latest stable one. Um, we're on a yearly schedule now. So Octopus was released in March this year, and Pacific will be in March of next year. Actually, there's a typo on the slide there. That should be 2021. Um, we're still backporting. Two releases back, so that means we're still fixing bugs in Mimic and Nautilus at this point. And you can upgrade up to two releases at a time as well. So you can go directly from Luminous to Nautilus or from Mimic to Octopus. But in order to go from Luminous to Octopus, you have to stop in Mimic or Nautilus first. So, so uh, as we look at what's new in Octopus, we can categorize things into five overall themes. We'll start off with uh, usability. This is a very important one for folks, uh, especially folks new to Ceph or storage in general. And this is where one of the largest improvements has happened in this past release. So with the Octopus, the Octopus release, the orchestrator API and the Ceph ADM implementation of it is now fully functional and ready to use. This, the idea behind this is to kind of unify the ways to deploy and manage Ceph so that all, lots of the logic is uh, centralized in one place within the orchestrator manager module and uh, users of Merck or Ceph ADM don't have to worry about uh, what's going on under the covers. Uh, they just take care of things through the, symbol, the same CLI or the same API. This also allows us to uh, kind of centralize and deprecate some earlier methods of installing stuff, such as uh, Ansible, DeepSea, stuff deploy, or Puppet. One of the big shifts here is also a move to uh, container-based deployment. So Ceph ADM takes a container image and deploys a container for each daemon. And it does so in, in a way more similar to um, other configuration frameworks where you declare what you want to run. For example, say you want to run three monitors, you can tell it to um, use these hosts, deploy a few monitors, three managers, three MDSs, and uh, some number of OSDs. It has fairly minimal dependencies as well, so it's very easy to get started with. You just run Simple bootstrap commands to create a new cluster and then add more daemons from there. This relies on uh, system D to manage the cluster, uh, each of the depending daemons. Um, the local container runtime, which can be Podman or Docker. And um, local uh, LVM to manage the disks. It can also adopt existing disks from earlier versions, which don't require LVM. So all your existing clusters can be imported, no problem. Uh, OK, I'll head a bit. OK, um, in addition to uh, just simply running the daemons, it also can manage, manage them on an, on an ongoing basis. So there's an orchestrator like uh, PS command that you can use to see all the demons that are running, uh, where they're running, and, and um, further interact with them. And there are some nice ways to uh, uh, tell Ceph ADM how to divide up your disks. For example, if you're deploying um, with a bunch of hard disks and they, they want to share uh, a few MDME devices among those hard disks where they're uh, blue store DB, you can easily specify that with the um, declaration of uh, what's called an OSD spec. You can find more details about those in the docs. 
Uh, one caveat about Cephadium is that it only supports Blue Store. So uh, in order to use it, you have to uh, convert, have your OSDs converted away from File Store to Blue Store first. And then it can take over and uh, adopt the existing cluster. One thing we're really looking forward to is being able to also automate the way upgrades are done. So you just run a single command like Ceph Orchestrator Upgrade, and Ceph ADM goes ahead and updates all the demons in the background and tells you when everything is all complete. This already worked quite well in our lab environment, and we're looking forward to expanding it further uh, for future stable releases. So now, um, another major part of uh, usability is, of course, the dashboard for Ceph. And Lens will please uh, take it away, and we'll discuss a number of improvements there. All right. Thanks, Josh. That's a, a good cue coming from the Ceph ADM part. The thing that I'm pretty excited about it is that basically um, you can bootstrap your Ceph cluster starting of a very minimal environment just consisting of one mon and a manager daemon. And within that manager daemon, you have Ceph dashboard up and running already. And our plan is at some point that you will basically be able to deploy the whole range of services um, that consist that the Ceph cluster consists of from within the dashboard. We haven't gotten there fully yet. Um, in Octopus, you are able to add hosts. So if you have configured the, the basic SSH setup to access these new hosts, um, you can add them through Ceph dashboard to make them manageable through Ceph ADM. And probably the biggest part of the job of, of deploying a Ceph cluster is rolling out the OSDs, creating the aforementioned drive or OSD spec, as it's now called, um, that basically is a, a way to describe in a kind of a pattern matching scheme which disks of your cluster should be used across all of the nodes. And Ceph dashboard also contains a functionality to automate that. I'm going to talk about this in a following slide. Um, first, I would like to start with some of the more user visible, noteworthy changes to dashboard itself. Um, the first thing you'll notice when logging in is that the layout has changed significantly. We have now moved to having the navigation between the various um, features that used to be on top of the page is now on the side. And that navigation bar can also be hidden to make up some more real estate for content if necessary. Um, previous versions of the dashboard also contained two different um, widgets that were showing information about notifications and another one that shows progress information. We have now unified this in a, in a new way. Um, you can see a screenshot of this coming up. And it also shows um, the information of all progress details that's of everything that's going on in the background. So every Ceph component that utilizes the, the progress manager module can basically send progress information. So it's visualized in the dashboard. Um, Ceph ADM is not there yet, unfortunately. That's something that is being worked on in this plant. So right now the OSD deployment process is a bit hard to follow on the dashboard at this point, but many other um, activities that are going on are were very easy to spot. Another UI enhancement that we made is that um, there are several tables in which you can now select multiple rows to perform the same action on those elements. This makes sense, for example, if you want to deal, mass delete a number of objects or if you want to apply different configuration settings to several objects at once. So these are just general usage enhancements, um, but there's more, if you could advance to the next slide, please, Josh. Okay, this is basically a screenshot of the landing page, as we call it, so you can now clearly see the navigation that has moved to the left with a small, what's called a hamburger menu on the top left to, to slide it away, which will then give more room to that landing page. Next slide, please. That shot here shows the new um, tasks and notifications bar to the right. Um, you can 
open it by clicking on the bell uh, icon in the top right. And on the top, you see all currently ongoing background activities and the notifications below if you have missed the pop-up that usually shows up when a task has been completed you can see the whole history here and then can either clear them all at once or delete them individually if you want to slide please the dashboard itself has also gained a number of features primarily around the user management um, one of the things that is quite helpful, especially if you're doing automated deployments, and it's something that Ceph ADM and Rook also support, is that you ask the user for changing the password the first time they log in. Um, you can now also change your own password without having to ask an administrator. Um, simple feature, but it was missing so far. Um, and we added a number of additional um, password policies that you can enable if you want to. They are disabled by default, but let's say you're deploying Ceph in an environment that makes cert, uh, certain expectations or requirements on your password security, like amount of characters, and number of special characters that need to be used, and, and various other things. These can now be enabled and configured if necessary. You can also let passwords expire and ask the users to um, update the passwords in, in certain periods. And if you are working with roles, it's now very easy to clone an existing role. If you just want to create a role with a slight deviation to one of the existing roles, it's a bit easier than having to construct a, a role from scratch. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Right, so a lot of focus and work in, in the Octopus dashboard went into the day two operations and particularly OSD management. So especially since the OSDs are Ceph's workhorses and usually require uh, the most maintenance once a cluster is up and running, we try to add a number of new features here. Um, like for example, the ability to actually see which disks are associated to an OSD. You can, if this enclosure supports it, um, via lib storage management, you can now blink the hard disk enclosure to identify a disk somewhere in your rack. Um, there's a lot of integration with the orchestrator. You can see um, an inventory of all the disk drives across all nodes, for example. And as I mentioned already, the ability to also deploy new OSDs on free disks that are still near cluster. So if you have added a new host, if ADM will perform an inventory and will show you all the disks that are attached to that node, and you are then able to select them as targets for new OSDs. Um, the, yep, more information about disks health. Um, we display smart data. Um, the health prediction module has been um, enabled so you can see uh, a prediction of the lifetime of your disk. We allow adding changing device class. So in addition to SSD and, and spinning disks, you can also create arbitrary device classes that you can then use for um, creating Ceph pools and, and applying crash rules to them. Right, next slide, please. These are just some right. screenshots of the features that I've um, mentioned before um, the way how you change your password upon login. You can see how you are getting, getting reminded when your password is expiring. And the top left image shows the user creation dialog. Um, the, there's also now an option to temporarily or permanently disable a user without deleting their account. So that's maybe useful if you have people being on vacation and they shouldn't be allowed to log in, then you can just disable that account for the time being. Overall, um, Ceph Dashboard still, of course, supports integrating into um, other authentication systems using the SAML protocol. This hasn't changed. Um, it's still also available if necessary. Right, please. Yeah, more features. Um, we added a number of new functionality to how you manage pools. Pool quotas, for example, are noteworthy here or the autoscaler that is enabled. Um, you can now 
on a pool level decide if Ceph should be auto scaling that pool or if it should just give you hints if um, well the number of PGs isn't optimal or you can disable auto scaling altogether. That's probably helpful if you want to make sure that one, some pools stay at the defined PG size while others may be more dynamic in, in, in changing their sizes. Brush placement rules I already mentioned. That's the part about device classes. Um, when it comes to the object gateway, we now added support for enabling bucket versioning, multi-factor authentication. Now choose the placement target when you create buckets over the via the dashboard. Next slide. CephFS has gotten some love as well. Um, you can now in the list of active CephFS clients also evict meaning you disconnect them from the CFFS. Um, you can manually create snapshots using the snapshot functionality that's built into CFFS. Quota management has been added, and we include a simple directory file system browser that you can use to traverse the structure of a CFFS file system. On the iSCSI front, um, you see the state of the gateways on the landing page now, so you get a better overview which gateways are currently up and running. Um, we added some safeguards before deleting IQNs um, if they are still have open sessions, which means that there's active traffic happening on them. And you can also see which initiators are currently um, talking to the targets. Um, monitoring is something that has been part of, of the dashboard for quite some time. We do embed Grafana dashboards in, in very uh, many places. And we are also using Prometheus Alert Manager to indicate um, alerts that Prometheus is aware of. And their alert management has also been improved. So you can now not just see the currently firing alerts, but basically all configured alerts that Prometheus. All right, moving on. I think that's it in a nutshell. Um, heading over to Josh again. All right. Thanks, Lens. Yeah, so there are also a few um, uh, other uh, improvements to usability at the latest level. Um, we tried to improve a number of the default behavior of Ceph. For example, with the PG autoscaler module on by default, it means you don't need to worry about the number of PGs that you when you're creating pools. It will automatically scale up the number of PGs as the cl cluster um, it, it fills up with data. And for CephFS and RGW, which have uh, more requirements for I.O. for their metadata pools, they know how to automatically create the pools with the right autoscaler settings and, and minimum number of PGs so that you get good parallelism uh, regardless of the amount of data in them. There have been some improvements for some of the internal health alerts. Uh, one of the major ones there is a new network monitoring health alert. So the OSDs will report uh, if the ping latency between them is too high when they're heartbeats to each other. And you can export more of those details, like um, averages or maximum and min, min ping times for different intervals uh, to your monitoring tools. A number of users have uh, different requirements for which thing, which uh, events in a Ceph cluster they want to react to and which ones they want to consider errors or not. So we've added the ability to mute um, health, health alerts, health warnings, or errors, um, either with a time to live. So you can have a, a temporary mute. For example, if you're, you're expecting to do maintenance on some OSD, maybe you don't want to have the cluster go into health warn while that OSD is down for an hour. Uh, these, will, these will automatically unmute themselves when the alerts change or if they increase in severity. For example, if you go from near full to entirely full. Uh, so I'm going to clean up of the of various commands, uh, including unifying the Ceftel and Ceftemon interface. So previously, you you had uh, a number of commands you had to be on a, on a specific host to run the same host that the daemon was running. These were um, accessed through the Ceftemon or admin socket interface. Now these are all also available over the Ceftel interface, which is uh, cluster-wide, so you can run, run these on any host and talk to any daemon. That was it for usability. Next, we want to discuss a bit about quality. 
There are a number of like, internal improvements within Redis to uh, improve the robustness and performance of the, of the cluster. Um, one is partial object recovery, which means that you only recover a cha the change portion of an, of an object, for example, for an RBD workload with lots of small writes. Instead of resyncing an entire 4 megabyte object, you only resync the like, 4K that was written to. This can improve recovery speed significantly. There's also better prioritization uh, during recovery, focusing mostly on PDs that are inactive or more degraded than others, so that the cluster becomes available and fully durable as soon as possible. There's also some improvements around snapshot trimming, where there was previously some metadata in OSD maps, which would grow larger and larger with cluster age and could cause some issues with uh, large maps consuming more CPU usage and more resources to process. Uh, those are all eliminated now, so the OSD maps can stay relatively small and cluster can keep running no problem with many, many snapshots over time. We also closed what we called the read hole, which is a very rare case. We're not even sure if anybody ever hit, hit it, quite hit it in practice, but where um, OSDs could, in a very rare circumstance, serve as stale, stale uh, client data. Another aspect of quality is uh, improving our, our knowledge and uh, of, of what's happening out, uh, among our users. So with Octopus, we have built-in uh, telemetry and crash reporting. Um, these are opt-in, and the, so a user has to uh, has to explicitly consent to the sharing their data uh, with the Ceph project. And if they do, then we, uh, we have some information about our cluster size, um, what kinds of cr uh, crashes may have happened, uh, and some information about their uh, devices, for example, uh, based on the smart data. Uh, there is a public dashboard available now, actually, at telemetry-public.ceph.com. You can see information about which uh, which versions are being used and uh, how many uh, devices are being deployed and how many OSDs per uh, per host, that kind of thing. And we hope to expand this further in the future uh, through collecting some more of these metrics about device health and, and failures to improve our, our uh, device failure prediction model to, let, uh, to try to predict uh, but when a device will fail before it does. We highly encourage all users to uh, opt into this if they're willing to, to help us uh, improve stuff and improve the ability of, of everyone to run it. Now let's talk about performance. There are a number of uh, performance improvements under the hood. Uh, especially in Blue Store, there are, is uh, improved prefetching and during compaction and for RoxDB and uh, uh, generally uh, an updated RoxDB version it has uh, other bug fixes included. There's better use of memory within the Blue Store's cache and better trimming behavior where it, it trims as it as it goes instead of on a periodic schedule which is it, a significant performance improvement. There's also tracking of um, OMAP utilization for, on a purple basis. This way you can tell uh, if a given pool is using too much OMAP data or uh, where your OMAP data is really coming from, whether it's from, for example, a bucket index pool for RGW or perhaps a, a log pool or or a CephFS directory. The purple map data does require um, an, running a, a blue store repair, which is uh, on by default. So when you first upgrade to Octopus, um, you know, the OSD will go ahead and um, add, uh, um, add that field to blue store, which might take a little bit of, a bit of time, depending on the size of the program data. Additionally, we reduced the minimum allocation size for Blue Store to four kilobytes, which matches the a sector size on these devices and significantly reduces the overhead for storing small objects, especially in a ratio coded environment. Previously, for Flash, this was 16K, so if you were storing, say, a 4K object, 
you'd have an overhead of uh, four times. Let's say every 4K object would take up at least that 16K minimum. So that saves ton of, tons of space and also improves performance a bit. In RGW, there's a lot of work going on, going on to refactor things to be more asynchronous. Uh, this started with the Beast front end to replace the VetWeb, which is asynchronous itself, and so it's moving forward with a Boost ASIO request processing, which will take the asynchronous request from the Beast front end and send them all the way down through onto the wire. There's also a lot of efforts around wording uh, using the OMAP structure, which is essentially stored directly in RocksDB when it's not necessary, since it has um, some, some overheads which aren't necessary for uh, a number of use cases. So we, there, uh, RGW is now using simple uh, FIFO queues for garbage collection and attempting to uh, also add that, add that uh, support for some of its multi-site logging capabilities to avoid overwhelming uh, the RocksDB and becoming bottlenecked on CPU. For RBD, there's a lot of work around uh, caching. Firstly, it, there's a few ca uh, types of caching here. There's an improved uh, implementation of the in-memory cache on the client side. It does simple I.O. batching. It doesn't worry about trying to cache any, any I.O. for reads. And due to the way it's structured, it's, it's a much, much simpler and much faster. So it's a tremendous boost in performance for the client side there. So now let's talk a bit about uh, multi-site. This has been a theme across various use cases in Ceph for years now, but there's still many improvements that are coming up. So the first is in RBD. So RBD mirroring um, prior to Octopus had provided, provided uh, some point-in-time crash-consistent views of images that you could use for disaster recovery. The uh, the downside to this is that it's very high overhead in terms of I.O. Because you have to essentially journal all the changes or all the writes that um, go into RBD images into a, a journal stream that's re replayed on the, on the other sites. So there's a new version of this in Octopus, which is based on snapshots rather than an ongoing journal, which requires much less I.O. overhead and will also work with kernel RBD whereas the RBD mirroring today, which requires uh, user space RBD clients. Additionally, the setup for this is much much simpler now. So you simply have one command you can run in each cluster and you copy and paste, and then it's all, it's, you're good to go. For RGW, um, Multi-site support has been there for a long time as well. If you have the, already have the ability to federate multiple sites. You have a you can have a global bucket and user namespace, and you can choose to replicate data asynchronously between zones at a site or zone granularity. With Octopus, we also add the bucket granularity, so you can choose which buckets you want to replicate and which ones you don't to different sites. So now let's talk a bit about what's going on in the Ceph ecosystem broadly. There's a lot of effort going on into um, improvement, improved integration with Ceph CSI and Rook. We're using Ceph with, within Kubernetes. So there's, there's now support for full support for RWO and RWX in Ceph CSI. Um, these are modes of attaching volumes in Kubernetes, namely read-write once and read-write many. And they both support snapshots, clones, and all the other operations that you would expect. There are also a number of improvements in work for around the octopus cycle, including um, being able to use CSI very easily, uh, being able to run 
monitors and OSDs on top of other pers uh, persistent volumes, which is mainly useful if you're running trying to run stuff in a public cloud environment. There's also support for um, using object storage via what's called uh, object bucket claims. So being able to provision object storage from, a, from your Microsoft cluster that work, work is controlling and let uh, uh, other, other users within Kubernetes utilize that storage. Work has, work has also been able to manage upgrades for stuff for a little, little while, uh, a few weeks releases, releases now, but there are more improvements in how it's doing this, or it's waiting for cluster to make a healthy between each step and trying to avoid any kind of disruption to service and availability by uh, using a, a, a budget to determine how, how long things can, uh, a pod can be unavailable. So that's about it for Octopus. Um, at this point, I think it would be a good time to see if anybody has any questions. I see a question in the chat. How does orchestrator Cepha ADM handle drive failure? Uh, so currently, uh, Cepha ADM doesn't tr uh, handle it directly itself. It still behaves like uh, an existing Ceph cluster where the administrator would have to um, Go and I believe that deploy a new uh, drive, a new OSD. I'm not entirely sure about that though. I think there are some uh, thoughts around trying to automate that more, if there are spare disks. Yes, maybe if I can chime in, there is now an, an option to replace an OSD in, in the sense that um, Safe ADM will remove the OSD but preserve the OSD ID so that Safe doesn't start shuffling data around. And then you can cre recreate that OSD with the same ID pointing it to a new drive. So that's something that I think will also be backported into Octopus. Thanks, Lens. Lens, you know if that were, uh, functions today with the um, monitors and managers, for example, if a disk for the monitor fails, does uh, CFADM automatically deploy a new one? Good question. As far as I know, this is limited to OSDs for now. Okay. But maybe if I think Ceph ADM Orchestrator has gathered enough functionality and features, it might make sense to have a dedicated tech talk just about that one. And yeah, I agree. What's going on there? Another question: Does Ceph know about SMR disks? Not today. Uh, there is work ongoing. In Pacific, though, to add a back into Blue Store, which does understand SMR disks and how to work with them efficiently. It's a bit of a research project at this stage, but it shows some promise. So today, I would um, I would say never don't not run stuff on SMR disks because the existing backends have no idea how to how to handle them, and their performance is entirely uh, different from a regular disk. But perhaps by Pacific or later, um, the new backend will be good to try out. Any other questions? All right, let's continue with uh, discussing what's coming up in Pacific then. All right, great. Thanks everybody for joining us live and thanks to Josh and Lens for putting together this presentation and a recording should be up shortly. Thank All you. Right, thanks folks. Thanks.